happening. Uh, my name is Tina Haskins. I am a bi biological oceanographer from Rutgers University. I want to give a little bit of a shout out to the cool room. I believe that they're listening right now. I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about AUVs and specifically the Slocum Glider, which I have been operating aboard the Thomas G. Thompson. An AUV is an autonomous underwater vehicle, and we are able to remotely control them through satellite interface. Uh, this connection, unfortunately, is only available when the glider is at the surface. Uh, our AUVs, like I said, are called Slocum Electric Gliders, and uh, they're equipped with various sampling devices, including a CTD, which gives you your temperature, conductivity, and depth, as well as various optic sensors for looking at turbidity, light penetration, chlorophyll, backscatter, um, and some other various sensors. In front of you, you're looking at a uh, view of a Slocum glider completely taken apart in, in its various pieces. Uh, some of the important pieces that we'll go over, starting on the left, is uh, where you see that sign for altimeter, is the front section of a glider. Uh, where the altimeter is housed, which is actually looking for the bottom, is also a wet section. And that's uh, very important because it's, allow it's what allows water to enter or exit the system, uh, changing the ballast of the glider and effectively allowing it to dive or climb. The buoyancy pump is a uh, piston motor that'll push back or pull or pull back or push forward, um, which allows that water to enter the system or exit, allowing the glider to dive or climb. Next we have our science payload or the science bay and this is a really neat tool that the Slocum gliders have because that science bay can be outfitted with various sensors. So you could essentially take one glider into, a field with you, into the field with you but have multiple payloads so that you can change your science objectives and change your sampling uh, game plan on the fly. All the way in the back of the glider, you'll see where it says fin as well as uh, antenna. This whole system on the glider is called the digifin, and the fin is actually what allows the glider to maintain its track and follow a heading and get from point A to point B successfully. Uh, it also houses, that digifin also houses all of the antennas that we use to communicate with the glider and for the glider to know where it is. Uh, the most important being the iridium antenna. That's the actual communication antenna. Uh, it allows the glider to place a, a rather expensive cell phone call, and then it connects to a large computer in the cool room called Dock Server. And once it's connected there, uh, we can be anywhere in the world uh, talking to these gliders. Uh, free wave is a free is literally just a free form of talking to the glider, and then you have your GPS and Argos, uh, which are positioning instruments, so the glider can know where it is. This slide is going to show you uh, how a glider actually flies. Each dive and climb is called a yo. Um, so on the screen in front of you, is you would actually see two yos. And again, all that happens is the gliders are neutrally buoyant when they enter the water. And when that buoyancy pump pulls back, it allows about a cup of water to enter the system, allowing the glider to go down into a dive. Here's a little video footage we have from off the coast of New Jersey, where you can actually see a glider diving and heading towards the bottom. Unfortunately, this one actually hits bottom before turning around and coming up into a climb. Uh, ideally, that doesn't normally happen. And uh, shortly in the background, you can see a second glider entering the picture. And this one does a very nice dive and is now inflecting and heading back up into a climb. And again, this is all accomplished by uh, just a change in buoyancy from that buoyancy pump. Here we have uh, some video footage of the actual deployment that we did of RU-25, which is the glider that I brought on board with uh, Thomas G. Thompson. Uh, this We use small boat ops because it's a lot easier to control the glider staying away from the boat than accidentally getting sucked under it, which would potentially be catastrophic. Um, small boat ops off of large ships enable us to do deployments uh, pretty much all over the world. Uh, we do a lot of Antarctic work, and a, a lot of that's all based out of small zodiacs as well. You can see it was actually a little bit of a rough ride this day. But the, uh, the cart that the glider's on actually acts as a cradle, and the glider, as you'll see in a few minutes, will just slide right off of that cart and into the water. Before deployment, it's important to make sure we put the wings on. You can see that we snap them in place and then kind of give them a wiggle to make sure they're nice and secure. 
There's also some uh, pre-dive checkouts that will go through, which will either be done by myself aboard the Zodiac or uh, from overseas over in the cool room. Uh, this deployment, I actually had the cool room take over just because it was a little wet and dicey on the boat. You can see the cart then just gets lifted at an angle and we let go of the glider and it'll just go sliding right in and uh, that'll start our mission. And like I said, we'll then hang out on location and uh, wait a little bit to, to make sure that our test dives go well. Uh, one of the missions is called an over-depth mission, which is just checking the ballast of the glider to make sure that it will not only dive, but resurface, which of course is extremely important for our mission to go successfully. Here we have uh, the day of the recovery. Uh, the glider was a, that we deployed was a thousand meter glider, so it was consistently doing yo's from zero to a thousand meters. This is what we call a deep glider. Uh, our glider was only equipped with a CTD for this mission, uh, but it con collected that data continuously during the eight days it was deployed. And um, all of that data, once we get it back, is housed live on our websites. So you can see. Uh, on the day of recovery, we go up into the bridge and I'm standing in front of my laptop because I can actually, once I pick up the glider on FreeWave, which is that free version of talking to the glider, uh, I can directly interface with it. And during recovery, I'll stand up there and uh, literally type the word where and it'll give me back its exact latitude longitude. And you can see we had a couple spotters uh, on the bridge who were helping look for the glider to make sure that we're not either going past it or that it's directly in front of us. Uh, once, the glider, uh, once the glider was in sight, we again lowered the small boat and did uh, small boat ops and just pulled it back on the boat and came back and called it a day. One thing that was really neat about this deployment was even though it was only out for eight days, we did accumulate a little bit of biofouling. When they glider came back on the boat we noticed these tiny black specks all over it and uh, Leslie actually collected a bunch of these samples and we put them under the microscope and this video that you're watching is what we saw. These are uh, barnacles in their larval state and this was really neat footage for us to get because we've we've collected biofouling before but it's always been once they're full-grown barnacles uh, so it's really neat to have some evidence of them in a younger stage and how they start to actually collect and build up on the glider and uh, that's pretty much concludes my uh, spiel on Slocum gliders uh, you can see the are you cool website listed below uh, we have all of our data housed there coming into the Coastal Ocean Observation Lab, including uh, other various glider missions that are currently going on. So I urge you to uh, check out the website and uh, follow along on some of other, our other adventures, as well as listening to the blogs and things of that sort. So thanks and have a great day.